So in Matthew chapter 1, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Everybody got that? All right, let's go to Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. I want you to see something as it comes clear in what's called Liverite law. Uh, the law of the Leviticus, the ideas that were imposed on the covenantal community of Israelites. So in Deuteronomy chapter 25, and if you're not there, we'll wait. Uh, I want you to examine with me a uh, first few verses uh, I'm going to start in verse 1, but I want to get all the way down to verse 10. So we got some reading to do today. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1 through 10. If you're there, just say amen. amen. Suppose two people take a dispute to the court, and the judges declare that one is right and the other is wrong. If the person in the wrong is sentenced to be flogged, the judge must command him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of lashes appropriate to the crime. But never give more than 40 lashes. More than 40 lashes would publicly humiliate your neighbor. That's why Paul said he was beaten 39 save one. Because it was a matter of Levit Leviticus law to not go beyond 40s. Verse 4. You must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. If two brothers are living together on the same property and one of them dies without a son... His widow may not be married to anyone from outside the family. Instead, her husband's brother should marry her and have intercourse with her to fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law. The first son she bears to him will be considered the son of the dead brother, so that his name will not be forgotten in Israel. But if a man refuses to marry his brother's widow, she must go to the town gate and say to the elders assembled there, my husband's brother refused to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He refuses to fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law by marrying me. The elders of the town will then summon him and talk with him. If he still refuses and says, I don't want to marry her, the widow must walk over to him in the presence of the elders, pull his sandal from his foot and spit in his face, then she must declare, this is what happens to a man who refuses to provide his brother with children. Ever afterward, in Israel, his family will be referred to as the family of the man whose sandal was pulled off. And see, y'all all in the soap operas and whatnot. I just read the Bible. It's... Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Can't ask you to stand. This is too much to read, but it's too much to read and too significant for the story. And then I'll try to make sure the points uh, are truncated, limited, so that um, I don't keep you too long. Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. You've heard me say this in the last two weeks that in the last two weeks there are places in Genesis where we've come where I have said, I'd rather not deal with that. I said to my wife the other night, I do not want to mess with this text on a Sunday morning. But I'm a company man. I work for somebody else. Genesis chapter 38, if you're there, say amen. amen. About this time, Judah left home and moved to Adullam, where he stayed with a man named Hira. There he saw a Canaanite woman, the daughter of Shua, and he married her. When he slept with her, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and he named the boy Er. Then she became pregnant again and gave birth to another son, and she named him Onan. When she gave birth to a third son, 
She named him Shelah. At the time of Shelah's birth, they were living at Kizeb. In the course of time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Er, to marry a young woman named Tamar. But Er was a wicked man in the Lord's sight, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Er's brother, Onan, go and marry Tamar as our law requires of the brother of a man who has died. You must produce an heir for your brother. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. This present, prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother. But the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child to his dead brother, so the Lord took Onan's life too. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Shelah is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this because he was afraid Shelah would also, like his two brothers, so die like his two brothers. So Tamar went back to live in her father's home. Some years later, Judah's wife died. After the time of mourning was over, Judah and his friend Hira the Dulamite went up to Timnah to supervise the shearing of his sheep. Someone told Tamar, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Tamar was aware that Shelah had grown up, but no arrangements had been made for her to come and marry him. So she changed out of her widow's clothing and covered herself with a veil to disguise herself. Then she sat beside the road at the entrance to the village of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. Judah noticed her and thought she was a prostitute since she had covered her face. So she stopped, he stopped, and propositioned her. Let me have sex with you, he said, not realizing that she was his own daughter-in-law. How much will you pay to have sex with me, Tamar asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. Judah promised, but what will you give me to guarantee that you will send the goat, she asked. What kind of guarantee do you want, he replied. She answered, leave me your identification seal in its cord and the walking stick you are carrying. So Judah gave them to her. Then he had intercourse with her and she became pregnant. After which she went back home, took off her veil and put on her widow's clothing as usual. Are you going to stay with me? Verse 20 says, later Judah asked his friend Hira, the Adulamite, to take the young goat to the woman and to pick up the things he had given her as his guarantee. But Hira couldn't find her. So he asked the men who lived there, where can I find the shrine prostitute who was sitting beside the road at the entrance to Enam? We have never had a shrine prostitute here, they replied. So Hira returned to Judah and told him, I couldn't find her anywhere. And the men of the village claim they have never had a shrine prostitute there. Then let her keep the things I gave her, Judah said. I sent the young goat as we agreed, but you couldn't find her. We'd be the laughing stock of the village if we went back again to look for her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has acted like a prostitute. And now, because of this, she's pregnant. Bring her out and let her be burned, Judah demanded. Ah. But as they were taking her out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns these things made me pregnant. Look closely, whose seal and cord and walking stick are these? Judah recognized them immediately, I bet he did, <laughs> and said, she is more righteous than I am because I didn't arrange for her to marry my son Sheila and Judah never slept with Tamar again. When the time came for Tamar to give birth, it was discovered that she was carrying twins. While she was in labor, one of the babies reached out his hand, the midwife grabbed it and tied a scarlet string around the child's wrist announcing, this one came out first, but when he pulled, but then he pulled back his hand, and out came his brother. What? The midwife exclaimed. How did you break out first? 
So he was named Perez, and then the baby with a scarlet string on his wrist was born, and he was named Zira. And so you say, Williams, what in the world? Well, I'd like to tag this sermonic, driven by desperation. Driven by desperation. Not too long ago, I was watching a report on the engagement of Prince Harry to actress Meghan Markle. And I was overwhelmed with the way in which the engagement raised so many eyebrows because she happens to be biracial. One parent is white, the other parent is black. One parent is Anglo, the other parent African-American. And it's not just that she's biracial. The fact is she's also divorced and she happens to be an American actress. And it appears that this will be the first time an American divorced person will be included into the royal family in 81 years. In 81 years, there has never been an American divorcee permitted inside the royal clan. And I was thinking to myself how interesting this would be because when you look at the picture uh, of, of, of this woman as a part now of the royal clan, there are some people who because of her biracial characteristics would obviously determine she doesn't belong in that picture. In fact, there were some who think because she's from the most crime-ridden area of Los Angeles, they've identified her past as being part of gangster royalty. And so now you have the amalgam, the assimilation of gangster royalty with European royalty. And it has left some people on both sides of the ocean losing their mind. When I started to think about this, I couldn't help but be drawn to Matthew chapter 1 and the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis. Because what I've come to recognize that there are some people in genealogical lines that you would look at and you would say they don't belong in that family. But what I really like about God is that God doesn't care what everybody else thinks. God has an incredible way of placing people in genealogies and in families and in portraits and places where others would look at and say, you have no right to be there, God says, that's not the way my family looks. That my family is typically the one that brings in the outcasts, that brings in those that no others believe belong, and permission to access God's family is the thing that makes me most excited about who God is. Now, when you look at this text, I realize it's easy to lambast Tamar and somehow make her the object of incredible ridicule. But let's keep in mind what we read in Deuteronomy 25. And let's keep in mind what we read in Matthew chapter 1. Because she's listed in a genealogy that is royal. She is a part of the genealogical line of Jesus. And not only her, in fact, for Matthew to place Tamar in that genealogical line is major because in the ancient world, women were not included in the genealogies that were written. So that when Matthew puts together his genealogy, he includes not just Tamar, he includes Ruth, he includes Rahab, he puts into his genealogy not just Mary, he includes three other women who in the ancient world, when they saw their names listed, would have said they don't belong in that family. And one of the things that I'm incredibly amused by as I look at this story is the way in which God takes some people who look like they are all trussed up in righteousness and kind of exposes them so that we can see everybody got problems with their heart and nobody's got it all together. You say, Williams, why do you say that? Well, because when you look at this story in the 38th chapter, there are one or two things that I don't want you to miss. 
I want you to recognize the process of how this woman has become driven by desperation. You see, the text says to us that after the death of not only her own relatives, that something takes place in this passage that is simply not right. You see, according to the Deuteronomy law, the Bible reminds us that there was this responsibility that was given to families in order to protect and to preserve widows. You read this story in your 21st century lens and you get stuck in sex. This is not about sex. This is about protection. This is about provision. Because a woman in the ancient world without a husband, without a clan, was left in desperate straits. And so when you look at this passage, you like to, in an American, evangelical, all too typical way, see the problem with Tamar. But you don't see the problem with everybody else in the text. You don't recognize that Tamar is actually a victim of injustice. And instead of seeing Tamar as something other than a trick, we can't recognize that she has been somebody who has been denigrated, her humanity stamped out, and rather than recognize that we see her as someone worthy of ridicule when in fact she's more righteous than Judah. You say, Williams, make your case. I intend to. Here is a man who had a responsibility, and his responsibility was in keeping with the law that God had established. This is not her being cunning. This is her being vulnerable. Onan was responsible to provide an heir with Tamar that would enable her to be sustained while he also provided and protected for her. But Onan has decided that he'll sleep with her and rather than move to the final conclusion of that deal, he decides he won't. Now somebody said, Williams, this is the passage uh, where I want you to know the Bible advoc advocacy is against masturbation. Wrong. That's not the passage. This is not about masturbation. This is about pre, this is about, this is about withdrawal. Come on, don't go to sleep on me because you feel like I'm heading in the woods. This is a, this is about, this is about a kind of, a kind of withdrawal before she can be pregnant that is downright mean and vicious. The idea is that Onan wants all of the pleasure but none of the responsibility. It's not the first time he's done it. He's done it repeatedly for years, and his commitment is that I'm going to get mine, but I don't want to go fulfill what God has designed in this act, so I'll use you and get what I want out of you, and at the appropriate time, make sure I have no responsibility. She has lived under this for a while, and instead of Onan doing what was right, he has made her nothing more than a victim. And you see, you say, Williams, how do you know that this act was not right? It was so heinous to God that God killed the boy. And every now and then, I like to run into some people who love what God loves and hate what God hates. Because I keep running into Christian people who have a way of minimizing what's maximum and maximizing what's minimum. Every now and then, you ought to recognize that the same things that God hates, you ought to hate as well. But no, the problem is everybody is trying to play nice. Everybody's trying to pretend that they are the best thing since sliced bread. And the reality is when you see evil, when you see injustice, when you see meanness, you know what bothers me about some of my evangelical brothers is that they have taken the faith and hijacked it and covered it up in a veil of meanness, claiming that it's for love of God. This girl is a victim, and when you have been victimized, you become desperate. When you need righteousness to be remediated, when you need justice to be a part of your life, if you don't get it, there are times when you get desperate, and you will do whatever you need to do to get justice. Listen, there's no reason why Khalif Brower should have spent three years in Rikers prison for stealing a backpack. Yeah. 
how do you at 16 get sentenced? You know what? I was rushing to get this in under 30 minutes. I'm not going to do it now. If you got to go, just go. I took students to the prison and I had them engaged with the inmates. And they were amazed, some of them scared, because they discovered that in this system, these are Korean students. They discovered that in this system, if you're rich, you get bail. If you're poor, you get jail. Because when your bail is set at $3,000, $3,500, $4,000, $5,000, you don't have to be guilty. You sit until somebody in your family can raise your bail money. And whether you are guilty of the crime or not, you sit and some sit for a year, two years, three years. The boy I'm describing to you out of Rikers, he was found innocent. And after three years in prison, came out traumatized. I met a young man who had been incarcerated since he was 16. He was now 20 in Philadelphia. Do you know what it's like to have your adolescence shaped in prison? when there is supposed to be a right to a speedy trial in 180 days. But when you broke and when you black, especially, you don't get bail, you get jail. And I have people more consumed about how much time you read the Bible and whether or not you at prayer meeting. And you should read your Bible and you should be at prayer meeting. But if your Bible reading and your prayer never moved you to hate what God hates. Onan has abused this girl and Judah has victimized her a second time. You say, how do I know this? Because he sends her back to her family. The text says that he sent Tamar back. Here inside verse 11, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Shelah is old enough to marry you. Quotation marks, but Judah didn't really intend to do this because he was afraid Shelah would die like his two brothers. So Tamar went back to live in her father's home. You remember that in the ancient world, if a woman was betrothed to a man, it was as if they were already married. You remember when Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant. He has to talk to God and secretly think of how he can divorce her. And you all say, well, wait a minute. What are you talking about divorce when they're not really married? No, in the ancient world, if you were betrothed to somebody, it was as good as if you were married. And so Tamar's position is that she is now based upon the Liverite law. She is now betrothed to Shayla, the younger son. And what does Judah do? He sends her back home. You know why he does that? Because if he can get her out of his face, it means he can go on with the rest of his life. But guess who can't go on with the rest of her life? You see, when you're betrothed to somebody, if you marry somebody else, you're an adulterer. And so he sends her back to her daddy's home where she has to wait while he goes on with the rest of his life. She can't marry. She can't move on. She is stuck. And he has placed her in a position where she is stuck. She can't move. She can't marry. She can't have a life. Because if she does, she would be violating the betrothal commitments. And Judah has put her away so that he can go live his life. But she has to endure living under the auspices of the law. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see how wicked that is? And so here's what she does. She dresses like a prostitute. You say, why does she do that? Because she knows something about Judah. She knows what Judah like. See, 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 this is somebody that's been in a family for a while. And, and she knows what rings Judah's bell. See, I would advocate, this is, this is obviously reading between some lines. But look here, she knew where to go and she knew how to dress because she knew Judah's flavor. 
And so she takes off her widow's garment and puts on the clothes of a prostitute. And when Judah comes by, the deal is sealed, the deed is done, and she's not stupid. She gets his passport, his credit card, his fingerprints, his DNA swab, because she knows something about the man. She hasn't got justice from Onan, and she knows she won't get justice from Judah. And sometimes when you are desperate, you will do things driven by desperation. Somebody said, Williams, is it right? No, it's not right. But you gotta understand people in the world that we live in. And you've gotta understand that sometimes people who are pressed do desperate things. The deal is done, the deed is sealed. And she winds up pregnant. And Judah, wouldn't you know it, is filled with righteous indignation that now his daughter-in-law is the talk of the town because she's taken off her widow's clothes, she's taken off her prostitute's clothes, and had to put on maternity clothes. Now he would have been fine, except now the whole village knows it. And when the villagers come and say, look here, your daughter has played the harlot, he loses his mind. And now his reaction is, listen, forget a judge and a jury, just burn her at the stake. I don't want to hear what she's got to say. I don't want to hear what her issue might be. Just burn her. And she says, that's fine, but before you do, I, I, I got some stuff that I need to show you. I, I know you're indignant, but, but, but during the trial, I need you to know before you burn me, I, I need you to see some things. And, and it, the text reminds us that, that what she does is she gives the evidence that suggests Judah is not more righteous than she is. In fact, he's less righteous. You know what I've discovered? I've discovered that, that people are funny until the shoe is on the other foot. Do you know how self-righteous people can be when they haven't had to go through it? You see, you can be real heavy-handed on the sins of other people until that stuff finds its way in your door. And then when it comes your way, you start shuffling and backing up. Why? You don't understand that everybody is subject to these things. I have watched people assume a posture of self-righteousness about divorced people, about addicted people, about incarcerated people about people going through tough times in their relationships. I've watched Christians become heavy-handed and high-minded, but it changes when you go through. Yeah. Burn her. She said, well, before you burn me, I need you to see something. And when she shows him the evidence, he finds himself not nearly as righteous as the girl who's a widow, prostitute, and now with child. Now let me tell you something. I didn't come here to tell you that I'm gonna endorse prostitution or I'm going to endorse deception, or that I can endorse incest, or I can endorse bribery. I, I, can't, I can't endure that. I can't endorse that. But I did come to tell you that, that Tamar is not trash. I came to tell you that this girl is actually more righteous than the self-righteous Judah. And I came to tell you something about the family of God. Because in the family of God, there are people who are in his family that don't look like 
they should be in his family. But they're there. And I came to tell you that sometimes people who have had all kinds of sordid passes don't know whether or not they can find acceptance in God's family. I came to tell you that sometimes what we do in our families is we like to hide the black sheep. But what God does is highlight the black sheep. And I came to submit to you that somewhere there's a young girl who's had an abortion. She's trying to figure out, is there any place in the family of God for me? Somewhere there's a young boy who got turned out at a young age and now his affection for men is more provocative than for women and he's trying to figure out, is there a place for me in God's family? Somewhere there's a man who fell on hard times and stole from his job and was dismissed. And now he's trying to figure out, is there any place for me in the family of God? And I'm saying, look in the Bible and you'll see that God has a place for you in his family. I'll tell you something. One day I was taking a picture with my wife. We were away and the guy who we gave the camera to was taking a picture and somebody walked by and they did something that's popular. They call it photobomb. And when we looked at the picture, we were thinking to ourselves, he ain't got no business in there. He back there going. <laughs> and I thought that's a perfect metaphor for who God is and how he does us. Because sometimes you'll look at the portraits of people and you'll say they don't have no business being in there. But God will look at his portrait. God will look at his family. God will look at his genealogy. And while they don't look like they belong to you, God says, no, that's exactly who I want in my family. And if the truth were told, all of us could recognize we don't have any business being a part of the family of God. We were homemongers, liars, gangbangers, dope dealers, shooters, and users. But because of the grace of God, Lord, I wish I had somebody understood. You don't belong there, but by his grace, by his mercy, because of his love, he brought you in. And now we who are commoners are a part of the royal clan of God. You should never let anybody make you think because of your past or because of who you are that God cannot accept you. Your resume of being broken and bruised and battered is the perfect qualifications for being a part of the family of God. And I'm so glad. Anybody else glad about this? I'm so glad. That God is not fussy and choosy. That God takes the broken and the lame and the blind and the halt and says, come unto me. All you that are heavy laden. I didn't come seeking those that are well, but I came looking for those that know they need a physician. Because of that, we have been brought into the family of God in spite of our scandal. God has given us access into his family. And the reason why you see the genealogical lines of people who were less than common is because God has included them as a part of a genealogy that points to Jesus and the saving grace of a God who loves us. And to that end, we are glad.